After Dr. Kim Tola presents to you the UWorld Step 2 Question Bank and its features, Dr. Bruce Raymer, the president and co-founder of Elite Medical Prep, will show you how to put all of this to work and get maximum use out of your question bank, ensuring that you will be successful with both the shelf and the USMLE exam. You'll notice at the very bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A portion um, open during the presentation. After both presentations, we will go to the Q&A, but should you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. screen. We, don't want to admit, we don't want you to forget any of your questions. We will work through all of these questions to ensure no questions go unanswered. I will not keep you waiting any longer, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Ken Tola. Thank you, Kelly, and I just want to say thank you to all of you who are joining us. Um, my background is in plastic and reconstructive surgery, and I also have a degree in English literature. Uh, so your world's a great fit for me. Um, I contribute to the surgery and anatomy curriculum here, and I also uh, review and standardize content um, from other physicians on our team. Um, today, uh, let's jump into the UWorld uh, question bank for step two. Um, hopefully this welcome screen uh, is sort of like meeting up with an old friend if you used our product for step one. And when I say friend, I really do hope you can think of UWorld as a friend rather than a foe, even though it may feel that way at times, um, because a friend will support you towards achieving your goals and a good friend will even be willing to deliver the hard truth on occasion. And I know that's how a practice test can feel sometimes. And we hope you had a good experience with our step one product. And today, since most of you are familiar with our product, I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritties of every feature, but I'm mostly just gonna give you an overview of how you can best use our step two QBank during your clinical rotations and also for dedicated step two review. So as a background, when I joined UWorld in 2019, we didn't have a shelf review section at that time. Um, we just had step two review, but students were already using our product um, Kind of all the time on their clinical rotations to study for their shelf exams. And they were asking for an easier way to find the questions that corresponded to the different rotations. Uh, so we made our QBank, um, our Step 2 QBank, into a shelf review product as well. And we did that originally by splitting our existing questions that we had for Step 2. And then we also were then able to add some more detailed questions to the shelf review side because the shelf exams will test some topics at a higher level of detail than step two will. So for example, in the surgery realm, um, there'll be a few more specific questions on wound management uh, or potentially orthopedics on the shelf exam that you won't see on step two. So this gives us, gives us the opportunity uh, to help cover that for you. Um, so we have two modes, a shelf review mode, which you can use during your clinical rotations, and we have the step two review mode. Um, so I want to point out, um, as of this morning when I checked, uh, there's nearly 4,000 questions under shelf review and a little over 4,000 questions under step two review. So these questions are not entirely identical, but there is some overlap, right? So in the shelf review section, there's some shelf only questions. In step two review, there are some fresh questions um, for high yield concepts that you wouldn't have seen under shelf review. But the reason I want to point this out is so that when you subscribe and you open up your QBank, you don't get overwhelmed by thinking that there are like over 8,000 unique questions that you have to get through. If you start early and study these questions throughout your entire clinical rotations, you would have already gotten a really close to first pass done um, through the questions. There'll be a few additional ones under step two review, but you would be setting the foundation for step two success by studying as you go through your clinical rotations. So when you go to create a test during your clinical rotations, you'll want to be in the shelf review mode, and there you'll easily be able to find the questions that correspond to the rotation that you're on. So you can see those listed here. Um, what we recommend is that before you begin the clinical rotation, you sign in and see how many questions are available. You'll see that in the bubble that's next to the shelf subject, and then divvy that up over the course of your clinical rotation, um, you know, by week, uh, by day, how many you need to do to get through that number of questions um, with a few days to spare before your shelf exam. Now, I want to acknowledge that it can be challenging to try to fit these questions in at the end of a long clinical day. Um, but really starting early and breaking this number of questions into bite-sized pieces is the best way to try to keep it manageable and see if you can incorporate the questions into downtimes throughout the day. 
So I know I'm going to date myself, but when I was studying for my shelf exams, we didn't have, we would barely had smartphones and we didn't have the UWorld app. And so I was trying to take these, you know, paper books um, and, and find room in my white coat along with my power bars and all my equipment um, to have questions that I could study for the shelf exams. Um, and I kind of used to joke that I felt like a pack mule because I had so much stuff um, in my white coat pockets, but that doesn't have to be you. Now it's less awkward um, to be able to study throughout the day. So you can download New World um, onto your phones and use it um, on your lunch break or kind of when you have those in-between times to try to fit some of those questions in during the day. I also want to encourage you um, as you're kind of going through these clinical rotations, and yes, the days are long, but the years are short, as they say. Um, just remember, you're not just studying for the shelf or step two. You're really integrating these clinical concepts that are going to make you into a better doctor. And you'll also be developing stamina that you're going to need for residency, which is very similar to your clinical rotations in that you're spending the day in the hospital and then going home and studying about your patients or your specific uh, service material at night. Um, so just take it a day at a time and keep checking the boxes. And before you know, um, you'll be graduating. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to, to kind of give you that encouragement while we're here. And before I leave this slide, I wanna just talk real fast about the numbers that are in the bubbles. Um, so again, in our shelf review, we have nearly 4,000 questions. If you were to add the numbers in these bubbles together, you'd get around 5,000. So I wanna explain that. Um, there are some questions that are really essential high yield for two different shelf exams. So for example, surgery and emergency medicine are both gonna have a focus on blunt thoracic trauma. Now, there is not gonna be complete overlap, but there may be a couple questions that show up in both of those shelf sections. At most, you'll see a question in two shelf sections. Most questions are not repeated though. But let's say you take your surgery rotation first, you're gonna get through that number of questions and you'll see that the number of questions in emergency medicine will decrease a little bit. When you get to emergency medicine, there's a couple options. You can either select all questions under your question mode to see everything that we believe is important to emergency medicine, um, or you could do the unused questions and then maybe come back and take your incorrect questions um, before your shelf exam. So there's just like a lot of different ways to use it, but I wanna make sure that you understand that. When you're on your clinical rotation, um, you can also kind of drill into questions that relate to what you're seeing that day on the ward. So let's say you're on internal medicine and you're spending a couple of weeks, maybe one or two weeks on the cardiology service. Um, then you can go to the medicine shelf subject and the cardiovascular system. Um, and then you're gonna be able to really reinforce what you're seeing on the wards. Maybe you have a, a patient who, um, sorry, we're doing extra clicks here. Uh, maybe you have a patient who um, is in heart failure that you're taking care of. That would be a good time to go home and to take the heart failure and shock questions that night to really reinforce what you're seeing. So you set up this cycle of seeing, learning, and applying, and then you do that for the rest of your career. Once you've gotten through your core clinical rotations, um, you'll wanna switch over to step two review. And remember, if you've been doing all the questions all along, you'll have nearly a full pass under your belt. Um, and so now based on how much time you have to study, and I know that varies widely by school, you can choose to do unused questions and then incorrect and marked questions, uh, or you could do like a full second pass through the bank, um, which can be really helpful. Also during your step two review time is when you're gonna want to do the self-assessments. And there's two of those. Um, each has 160 questions that are distinct from the regular QBank. Um, we recommend that you don't hoard these until the end. Um, we recommend that you instead do self-assessment one during the beginning of your study period. Um, that will give you a baseline for how you're doing. And then do self-assessment two, maybe a week or two prior to the end of your dedicated study period. That will help you see the progress that you're making but you'll still have enough time that you can still tweak your study strategy if needed. Um, there's also some other uh, tests that you can take through the NBME and intersperse those throughout, um, but I wanted to <clears throat> kind of give you our approach to how to use the self-assessments. So now we're gonna transition to talking about some of the other QBank features that can help you as you're studying.
Um, this test interface may look familiar. Um, there's a couple of test interface options. Um, this is the NBME option, which uh, best simulates the NBME exam. Um, we also have the UWorld option, which is um, a little bit prettier to behold. But when you're in that dedicated study time and you're taking those randomized uh, question tests, we do recommend the NBME option just so that when you're on at the exam on test day, um, it'll it'll feel like the same interface and also all of the button placement, color, all of that stuff exactly mimics, mimics the exam. So just wanted to remind you about those interface options. Another uh, feature we have is split screen explanations. Um, so these are really helpful um, a couple different ways. First of all, logistically, um, it's helpful because you can open your flashcard pop-up box uh, kind of on one side and read the explanation on the other and transfer material more easily. Um, but also from a study approach, um, this allows you to quickly compare back and forth between the question and the explanation. And you can go back and look for any clinical clues that were important to getting the right answer. And especially if you didn't answer the question correctly, kind of find what clinical clues you missed. Um, and that's going to help you with your test taking strategy. Um, while we're here on the screen, I just wanted to mention too about the explanations uh, since I helped to write them. Um, that that's something we really pride ourselves on here at UWorld um, is the explanations. For those of you who may not be familiar, um, every explanation kind of has a certain style. There's three parts: uh, the explanation of the correct answer, the explanation of all the incorrect answers and then an educational objective, which is a two to three sentence a summary of the like highest yield points and the main point of the question. So even if you answer the question correctly, we highly recommend that you still read those explanations for the incorrect answer choices, because we try to pack as many clinical pearls um, and really focus on clinical reasoning in each of those wrong answer explanations. Um, so in your first pass through, when you're kind of doing it a little bit more slow and steady, um, we recommend that you read those. Um, I think you'll learn a lot from them. Another feature uh, we added pretty recently was a multicolored highlighting tool. Um, some students may want to use this. Uh, you can, as you're going through a question, for example, like highlight important uh, clinical history, the key clinical examination findings, um, the STEM, if this helps you to kind of keep things separate um, so that you can uh, think them over in your clinical reasoning to answer the question correctly, uh, please feel free uh, to make use of that. And then let's dive into uh, flashcards and my notebook. So you can take any of our written material or visual material and put it in either flashcards or my notebook. With the flashcards, um, once you've made them during your practice test, you'll find the flashcards tab has two different uh, options. There's browse, which is the best way to organize your flashcards. Um, you can create different decks um, and you can um, add flashcards uh, here using um, like other, other material. Um, you can delete things if you want to reorganize them. And then when it's time to study them, go to the study tab um, and you can study your flashcards with spaced repetition. So the nice thing about using UWorld world content to create your own flashcards is a, it kind of makes it a one-stop shop, um, but two, it's really customized to what you need the flashcards for. So if you've just gotten a question wrong on a practice test, make a flashcard. That means that it's gonna be one of the highest yield, highest yield flashcards for you in particular. With space repetition, we've um, harnessed that technology. You're probably familiar um, like Anki type technology um, where you're gonna see the things that are hard more frequently until you master them. Um, and then it's gonna get spaced out uh, to really challenge your brain to retain it long-term. So as you're answering a flashcard, you're gonna decide how hard that was for you. Um, was it easy? Um, was it good? Or do you really need to see that again? And based on that, um, it's gonna show, show it to you either uh, very soon or maybe four days from now. Um, this is what you'll see the first time you answer a flashcard, and then uh, there are additional options um, for subsequent times. With the notebook, again, you can uh, transfer any of our content uh, easily into the notebook. Um, this is where you'll find the notebook button within the test interface. And you can set up the organization however you want, up to four levels deep, um, nesting for your notes. And then you can also customize your notes. Um, 
with bold, italics, bullet points. And it's easy to drag and drop them in the left panel uh, to reorder them. You can also add tabs, um, which are searchable, um, if you want to do that. And then I want to talk about one more feature, which is this link button. Um, so most of you will probably subscribe to UWorld using the same email, um, probably your school email. Um, so this is a link feature. Um, anytime you have subscribed with a particular account, um, those the My Notebook can be linked between those accounts. So if you took notes in My Notebook during step one, um, you can turn this feature on and be able to see those notes as you're studying for step two. And since we think that there's going to be some basic science carrying forward into step two and step three, especially now that step one has gone past fail, um, that might be something that you want to turn on from time to time. Or as you're making notes for step two, um, if you're using your world to study for step three, which we hope you will, you can link forward and be able to access your step two notes as you're studying for step three. Okay, so in summary for our part, uh, we just wanted to kind of tell you how you could best use our product um, throughout your clinical rotations and your step two study time. So while you're on your clinical rotations, um, I would say start early, set a steady pace and study as you go. Um, you'll wanna to try to complete the shelf section during your rotation. Um, while you're doing that, you can add content to flashcards in my notebook. And then when you get to your de dedicated step two study time, uh, you'll be all set up. Um, you would have gotten nearly a first pass in. You can decide whether to do a second pass um, or to focus on unused questions and incorrect questions. And you'll also want to be taking those self-assessments. If you have created content within flashcards in my notebook, it'll be ready for you to use as you study. Okay, now I'm gonna transition it over to our colleagues at Elite Medical Prep. Okay, great. So I just want to make sure that um, so I guess my video, I guess everybody can hear me, and uh, I guess my video isn't working, but that's okay. Um, Simone, thank you so much for for the for the presentation so far. I'm going to pick it up from here, um, and I want to thank everybody at UWorld for allowing us to join, inviting us, and uh, having us join today. Um, my name is Marcel Bruce Raymer, uh, and as mentioned, I helped found Elite Medical Prep. It's an organization that specializes in tutoring for the COMLEX, USMLE, as well as shelf exams. We also have tutoring services for the MCAT, for post-residency board certification, and several specialties. In addition to my work with Elite Medical Prep, I'm a board-certified neuroradiologist. I completed my combined MD and PhD at Columbia, and then moved to UCSF to complete residency and fellowship in radiology and neuroradiology. And currently, I work as a radiologist for a group that covers hospitals in Stanford, Duke, John Hopkins and Rush University Medical Networks, amongst, amongst others. So at Elite Medical Prep, our team is comprised of highly trained MDs and MD candidates from top medical institutions. And we've worked with many thousands of students in schools across the US, as well as throughout the Caribbean and many foreign countries. Elite Medical Prep has developed strong institutional partnerships, including at schools like Mount Sinai, School of Medicine and UNLV, where we provide the official US only courses for students at those schools. So I wanted to start my comments off with a basic discussion of how to prioritize study resources for step two, and for that matter, any USMLE or COMLEX exam. In prior presentations, we've displayed this diagram showing a pyramid of how to prioritize one's resources. As we've previously emphasized, practice questions are the number one resources, number one resource that students should be prioritizing with their time and energy. However, today we're gonna to take a deeper look at that at the information that students can derive from practice questions to help improve their study efficiency. We're also gonna look at flashcards, which is the next step in our study resource pyramid. The key, this key study tool has been added as a feature of the Google Q Bank, as you guys have already seen. And so we're gonna go through that in a little bit more detail. Also, we're gonna take a look at how to effectively use note-taking, which is another feature, feature that you were just shown earlier in the presentation. And that's been integrated into the Google Q Bank. An additional resource, and one that was not listed on the prior diagram is personalized tutoring. As I mentioned, at Elite Medical Prep, we've been specializing in personalized one-on-one -on -one tutoring for nearly a decade. In particular, students have found our services very effective and helpful for the critical step two exam. Our professionally trained tutors focus on question-based learning techniques that emphasize the use and mastery of QBanks, such as UWorld. 
Tutoring provides one-on-one -on -one mentorship that helps students more effectively achieve their test-taking goals through a combination of, combination of coaching and learning techniques that we call structured personalization. We emphasize building personalized study calendars and helping students identify and strengthen areas of weakness. So in order to demonstrate how we're gonna maximize the use of the USMLE question and a Q bank such as UROLD, I wanted to get us started off with a USMLE step two style question. Here we have one of our challenge questions that we use when tutoring students one-on-one -on -one, and also when we give our customized step two course to third year students at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. For this question breakdown, I'm gonna quickly run through our four step approach to USMLE questions to find and confirm the right answer. Then once we've answered this question, We'll discuss how you can use the question and virtually every question in your QBank to consolidate information and develop mastery. So for our four-step approach, we first look at the last line of the vignette to identify the actual question that's being asked. And here we've highlighted that in green. So it says, which of the following agents is most likely associated with this patient's condition? Then, Let's quickly review the answer choices to see the range of possibilities and get a sense of the direction of this question. And those are highlighted in yellow. So here, a quick look reveals that we have a list of infectious agents, bacteria and viruses. So automatically, we know this is a microbiology-oriented question. Next, let's go back to the vignette and actively read and summarize to generate a one-line summary, what we call a one-liner. I've highlighted some of the key pieces of information in orange to create this one-liner. So I have 29-year-old woman, Due to history, weakness of arms and legs, and numbness in her hands and feet, and a four hour history of mild shortness of breath. Jumping down, we see I highlighted three weeks ago she had a respiratory illness and it resolved after 10 days. Additionally, I highlighted that the reflexes are absent and Babinski sign is absent bilaterally. So here we could come up with the following one liner based on the information Young woman with acute onset peripheral neuropathy, characterized by weakness and decreased sensation, that's progressing superiorly and started several weeks after recovery from a respiratory illness. Since we don't have labs or images, we can skip our fourth step in the process. However, for the sake of completeness, I'll remind you that we, rec that we recommend students avoid spending too much time on provided images on the test, since they rarely are necessary to actually answer the question. And far more often, reviewing the images becomes a large time sink for many students. So with our summary in hand, we can now go back to the answer choices and look for the best choice. And here that would be mycoplasma pneumonia, which would be the best fit. We need to recognize first that this patient is presenting essentially with Guillain-Barre disease. This is an acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy neuropathy that affects Schwann cells that myelinate peripheral nerves. Thus the syndrome leads to decreased sensation, weakness, and poor reflexes. Guillain-Barre syndrome is length dependent. Begins with the toes because this is the longest distance from the central nerve bundles to the end of a peripheral nerve. Classically, GBS occurs one to four weeks after a GI illness. The typical bug most of you are probably thinking about is Campylobacter, which is associated with bloody diarrhea. Campylobacter is not an answer option here. And that, that choice would likely be incorrect even if it was available today. Instead of a GI illness, we have a respiratory illness, as I've underlined in the summary, uh, as you can see on the screen. And therefore, mycoplasma is the best choice. Mycoplasma often leads to what we call walking pneumonia, a form of pneumonia that produces less severe clinical symptoms and also much more subtle radiographic findings than a typical low bar pneumonia caused by bacteria such as strep or staph. A high yield point here is that mycoplasma is associated with development of a number of autoimmune diseases where autoantibodies are generated. So we can exclude answer choices B through H as well because none of them have strong links to the development of Guillain-Barre disease. So in our prior course at Mount Sinai School of Medicine and elsewhere, we found that about 55% of students preparing for step two have gotten this question correct. Therefore, we would consider this question to have an intermediate level of difficulty. This is a question that you should spend time understanding the content associated with. As you probably well know, every you will question in your QBank will report a percentage of respondents who answer the question correctly. This is a metric you should be checking on every question when you're doing your review. To remind you where, the, where this can be found, I've taken a year-old question and highlighted it on the left. You can see that uh, outlined in yellow. When we, when we consider the percentage of respondents who answer a particular question correctly, we can roughly divide the questions into three groups. If greater than 70% of respondents get it right, then this is an easier question and the information should be considered critical to learn. If about 35 to 70% get it right, 
And this is a moderate level question. And this is important information that you definitely should try to learn for testing. However, if less than 35% of respondents get it right, you should consider that a harder question and lower yield information. And although you may want to focus on learning it, it's something you may want to delay learning or put to the side until you've mastered the critical and important information. Those are the easier and moderate level questions. Doing this is going to make you a more efficient and an effective studier and ultimately improve your performance on testing. So now I want to switch gears and talk about two other features that we have already been brought up and that are now available in the EuroQ Bank. And these are the new features of integrated flashcards and notebook that Dr. Cantola introduced earlier in the presentation. As Dr. Cantola showed you, when reviewing any UL question, you have the ability to create new, a new flashcard or add to an existing flashcard. I'm showing you the highlight of that feature here. However, what I want to talk about briefly is how to make an effective flashcard and avoid the most common flashcard mistake. And that's the problem of putting too much information on a single flashcard. This is by far the most common problem we'll see with students that we tutor for step one, step two, and step three exams as well as other exams such as the complex and postgraduate exams. Here we have a flashcard on the topic of Guillain-Barre. The flashcard was created by simply copying the excellent table that you see at the, uh, on this disease that you see at the end and the answer explanations that are provided with all the UWorld questions. However, we have a problem here as this table has way too much information to be useful for just one flashcard. My general rule of thumb is that a flashcard should never have more than five pieces of information on it. So in order to make these flashcards a bit more bite-sized and something more manageable to learn, I've broken them down this table to create two high quality flashcards. Also, if you're paying attention, you'll see that I made some small edits information to incorporate some of the points I mentioned during our earlier question breakdown. So you can see in the top card, we have Guillain-Barre pathophysiology, and we have about four to five, four points here, and I've added some little, little bit of information, including some uh, a reminder about peripheral nerves. Great flashcards, are ones that are either made by you or personalized by you because they're gonna fit your learning needs. And, they're, and the other thing about flashcards is that they're meant to be bite-sized, not to be super large chunks of information. Additionally, I wanna emphasize that flashcards are a key part of preparing for step two overall. You should set aside dedicated time on a daily basis for that, this activity. I would recommend at least an hour per day. In our standardized USMLE Step 2 study calendar that we hand out to students who work with us, we emphasize using about using flashcards for about two hours per day if possible, and that would be a dedicated time on a daily basis. Make sure to prioritize flashcards over passive learning activities such as video watching or reading review books. Make sure to really try to emphasize flashcards on topics where you're struggling or just have a hard time getting detailed information to stick. Finally, keep in mind that flashcards are a continuous process. A good flashcard deck is one that you continually edit and add to so that it fits your study needs. So we've talked about flashcards, but now I want to touch briefly on the My Notebook feature and how to make it an even more effective tool for learning. While taking notes can be helpful in dealing with complicated topics, certain techniques can make your notes more effective. Here, I've organized my notes using the Cornell Notes style. In this system, I divided my page into three parts. On the right side of my screen, I have what I call my notes. And these are the long form version of facts and concepts that I'm trying to learn. Here, most of them are copied over from the question explanations. Remember, you have these excellent question explanations at the end of every UO question, so you can really make use of these things here. Then, on the left-hand side of my page, I've created what I call my cues. And these are short phrases that help me categorize the notes on the right side of the page. On the bottom, I've simply taken, I've created a summary. And helpfully on almost, and on every UWorld question, you have a UWorld question summary. So you can copy that over. And then for this, this one, I've copied over a little bit of information about mycoplasma pneumonia at the bottom. With this note-taking structure, I'm setting up my notes in a way that forces me to think actively as I'm taking my notes. And it also sets up a situation where I can more easily review the notes and even the tests and, the, and even test myself, essentially turning the notes into another active learning tool, such as questions and flashcards. Remember, we don't want to make our notebook into a giant reference book, like those review books that we set aside when we started our dedicated preparation for step two. A couple of additional things to note about the My Notebook feature. 
picture, of course, is worth a thousand words. So try to emphasize using images and diagrams when taking notes. Remember that the notebook should ideally be reserved for more complicated topics that need extensive explanation. If it's a shorter topic, it simply needs to be memorized, try to stick to flashcards alone. Another great way to use the notebook feature is to use it to take notes during your existing classes or when you're using other review resources, particularly other passive review sources. Remember that you should not confuse the act of taking notes or rereading a note with actual mastery of a piece of content. That's where questions come in. That's how you're gonna develop real mastery is through doing and answering questions and also using flashcards. Finally, try to avoid excess, excessive highlighting as this has not been shown to be an effective study technique for long-term retention. I want to finish up to here, finish up here today by speaking briefly about the evolution of medical student learning styles. Over the 20 years I've been involved in medical education, student and educator, I found that initially, in the old days that we see in our older telephone, there was a time when students didn't use QBanks at all in the preparation for the USMLE or the NBME exams. And over time, students started to use the QBanks, but only during their dedicated study period. That was a, an era I remember when I took the USMLE. More recently, we've seen that students Starting to use, we're starting to use the Q banks more regularly, but only after they've learned a specific topic. So waiting until they learned it and then testing themselves. But currently, we recommend that students use Q banks as a daily tool to learn new material and also to reinforce old material that they've already learned. Now, with the evolution of adaptive learning flashcards, it's become clear that flashcards, along with questions, are, are a key study tool. That, that should be used throughout medical school and throughout your dedicated step two preparation. So without further ado, I'd like to open up the, uh, the, the presentation now um, for questions and answers. And I'm gonna pass it back to, uh, to the team at UWorld to take over and we, uh, we'll be available to answer questions. I just wanna note also that I'll be available as well as Dr. Cantola and also Dr. Ken Rubin, who's the, the uh, co-founder of Elite Medical Club. So you'll have the three of us uh, to be able to answer questions. And I know I've seen a number of questions already listed in the Q&A section of this, this webinar. Okay, I think that we have a couple of questions um, that I thought that we would answer live. And um, there's several of the questions that have been answered already. So I wanted to go through those questions we had answered already just to ensure if anybody else wanted to ask those, um, I'd clarify them for you. And then um, I will get on and ask the questions live and we'll kind of rotate throughout the, the three of the physicians on the call. Um, okay, so the first one was, um, I think that everybody probably saw it. We did record this webinar and there will be a recording going out to everybody. So if anybody missed the webinar and or you wanted to go back and touch on something, um, you'll be able to do so. So that'll go out in the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, but then the next question was specifically for IMGs, are the shelf questions different from the step two questions and what and how do you recommend we go through them? Um, and Dr. Cantola went through um, and basically just wanted to let you know that if you're using the QBank throughout clinical rotations, you can use the shelf review mode and the shelf subjects in a similar fashion to the US uh, medical students. However, if you're subscribing solely for S2 prep, as step two preparation, she'd recommend that you use the step two review mode from the beginning. It will cover everything you need. Um, the next question was, which mode do you recommend um, when studying for the step two CK, um, the MBME or the UWorld? And so I believe you're talking in reference to the interface options on this one. And if you're really using this simply for step two preparation, we would recommend that MBME um, interface option as that's as close to the act, actual exam as you will find. Um, and that way, if your main objective is really to prep and get yourself as prepared as possible for that exam, we would of course recommend that option. Um, the next question, which is a great question, is the link option available for flashcards um, like it is for the My Notebook. Um, you'll see that feature roll out um, here pretty soon. So you'll have the option for both My Notebook and linking the flashcards. To take this question just one step further, because it, it's going to come back up, um, if you do not have a live step two subscription and you had a step one subscription that expired, 
at this time, it does not look like you're able to go back and link the previous notebook and flashcards if you had an expi expired subscription. So if you're wanting to really make sure that you're going to have access to that step one uh, flashcards and my notebook feature, you would make sure that you want to go ahead and get that step two subscription purchased before the expiration date so you can go in and link those. Um, not saying that will never be something that is available in the future, but presently that is how it is today. Um, and then we have um, the question on somebody is saying they don't have the link option available in my notebook. Um, if you do not have that option for some reason, you please can email myself with your name, your email address that is registered to your um, UWorld account. Um, and I'll make sure that we type in my contact information so everybody will see it. Um, and I will get you taken care of. Um, and then the last question that we've already answered is how long do you recommend for dedicated study period um, for step two? And um, Dr. Rubin went in and gave a great answer and said a good dedicated study period for step two for the typical students is four to eight weeks, depending on when you are starting and depending on your score. Um, now that step one is pass fail, students may want to treat step two prep as they previously treated step one in terms of time and energy um, as step two scores are widely expected to become more important for residency. Um, okay, I think that um, Dr. Um, Rubin and Dr. Cantola and Dr. Bruce Raymer are going through and answering a couple, but um, we should go in and answer a couple of these live. Um, sure. And so why don't we start with um, Dr. Um, Bruce Raymer and I'll read, yeah, sure. this one. I'll read this one from you. And um, between tutor mode and timed mode, I've noticed I'm more effective in time using the tutor mode. However, I think I'm not practicing for the real thing. Any advice about that? So, so to be clear, the, 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 the questioner is saying they're using the, the tutor mode to prepare for the test, is that, is that correct? Uh, I guess I can- I, I, I believe just, so. Yeah, I can sort of play this out. And, and then um, and Dr. Rubin and Dr. Cantola, please jump in at any time. So I think the issue here is that tutor mode is a learning mode. It's fantastic It's for learning. It's a great way to sort of consult, to, to acquire the information, particularly when you're weaker in preparing for the, uh, preparing on certain topics. However, when you're really trying to prepare for test day, you have to keep in consideration that there is a time pressure and that time pressure is significant. So it's inappropriate to be preparing for the test without getting, you know, without doing adequate time in a, in a timed mode environment. Um, you should at least several weeks, probably three weeks or more out from, uh, from test date should be using time mode uh, for certain, for at least some of your blocks. And as you get closer to test date and, and the two weeks before, almost all of your, your study, your question blocks should be done in a timed mode fashion. Because even though the tutor mode may make you feel like you know it, spending two, three, four minutes per question is not appropriate for testing. You're really going to only have about 90 seconds per question on average. So some questions you'll spend more time, but other questions you're you're gonna you're, you're gonna be able to do them really fast. And so you want to have that time pressure to help build up that, that, that the stamina and also the ability to to think critically and quickly. Yeah, I want to completely agree with that, and and also add um, one of the tips that I like to give is. And this applies, I guess, for step two as well as step one, because I usually give it during step one study uh, period, but is that it's really good for students during their dedicated to simulate the exam as close as possible. Like with the self-assessments, you know, that's like a, it's four blocks of 40 questions, but the real exam is seven blocks of 40 questions. So you can do a self-assessment and then add on three practice tests that are 40 questions long uh, to simulate what that grueling test day is going to be like. So I would say, you know, do it basically not in tutor mode, do it in timed mode, um, do that many blocks of questions, maybe one or two Saturdays during your dedicated study period. And, you know, like block out your time, uh, the way you're going to do it during the exam, have your snacks, like really just simulate the actual uh, exam conditions. That way, when you are doing it for the first, it won't be the first time you do it on test day. Um, so I think that can be helpful if, if students can find bandwidth to do that. 
Uh, additionally, I think this may address a question that I see here. It's about assessing information and answering quickly in 90 seconds, a strategy for it. So we showed you um, of our sort of four-step approach. We kind of covered that in a quick fashion. We did it in a little bit more elaborate fashion on some prior uh, webinars that we've done targeted towards step one and a comma and the complex exam. So for that, for those nine, that 90 seconds, it's really, it's really effective if you read the last line of the vignette first. Remember, the question I showed you was on mycoplasma pneumonia, and it asked about the diagnosis, but we could ask about what's the next step in management, what's the next step in, in making the in diag in confirming the diagnosis. And you really won't know that until you get to the end of the vignette. So by reading that last line first, peeking at the answer choices just to get a sense of where it's going, and then actively reading, you're probably going to be more efficient with your questions. Whereas if you just read through it all the way and then figured out what they're asking, you may have to go back and read it again for a second time, wasting precious seconds. Perfect. Um, I think another good question that we've just been asked, um, and maybe um, Dr. Rubin, you can answer this, is how to still retain maximum um, information if someone has a one-year gap between step one and step two? Hey, everyone. Sure. Um, so that, that is a really good question. If So there, there often is a gap. There are some students who are on different schedules these days where they might even take step two before step one or for more and more medical schools are adapt or, or are transitioning to a curriculum where students do clinical work before they take either step one or step two and therefore they take them close together. But tr the traditional schedule is, is such where you take step one after second year and then you take step two after third year. So one year gap is a normal gap. Usually what's happening in the interim is students are taking shelf exams and shelf exams, you think about it, are really all together what step two is going to test. And of course, UWorld has the great option where you can toggle between shelf exam mode and dedicated step two mode when you work through the step two cubing. So even though there may be a gap, if a student is doing shelf exams and using UWorld, for example, as a cubing, to work on the different areas during that, that interim, usually entering a step two dedicated period, a student is actually in better shape than even they were for step one because they've been, they've been kind of building up. It's kind of if you're running a marathon and you, you run um, short races and then you go a, li a little longer, a little longer, and then by the time you get to the marathon, you have more stamina and are more ready. And so that if a student is gonna be doing clinical work work through the cubing during the year using the shelf exams. And then when you get to the dedicated period, you actually are not going to be behind the eight ball for not having done step one in a year. You actually are going to be in relatively better shape because you've been exposed to these types of questions all throughout your clinical work. And you have greater clinical context from having done, hopefully, these uh, rotations in the past year. Perfect. Great answer. Um, okay, I am going to ask um, Dr. Cantola this next question because I see it popping up um, a couple of times now. How many times should we repeat the UWorld QBank before we take the real exam? Um, I mean, that will vary by person, but I would say it's most important to get um, one really good pass to the QBank, which I think is best done in a slow and steady fashion throughout your clinical rotations. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, to at least get through your uh, questions that you uh, got incorrect or marked as difficult, um, looking at the performance data, um, kind of like your weaker areas, maybe repeating some of those areas. I mean, in the ideal world, two passes is great. Um, again, the first pass being that sort of slow and steady pass where you're reading the incorrect um, answer choice explanations um, and really, you know, kind of um, just digging deep into the explanations, you know, making your study resources. But that second pass doesn't need to be sort of done in that same way as the first pass. I like to think about it, the second pass is like kind of then test taking mode. So the first one was to really build your foundation of knowledge. And the second one is like taking those 40 question blocks that are, you know, random questions and they're timed. And then you're putting question blocks together and starting to, um, kind of really prep yourself for what the exam is going to be like. And in that case, like as you're, you know, it's a, it's a shorter period of time um, in that second pass, you don't necessarily need to read everything all over again for your incorrect questions. You'll probably want to do that. But if you've 
answered something correctly, just go ahead and you know move on because I know that at that point you're kind of in triage mode, um, and and so you can you can be more efficient in that second pass. Sure, great great answer. Yeah, I, I would I would second that, and I would, I would reinforce something that I learned from Dr. Rubin over the many years of working in test prep with students is that one of the big issues is students continue to try to think of hoarding questions and saving them for later. That is the wrong attitude. Questions are your best learning tool and you should use them right up front. Don't save it for later like a dessert. This is the main meal. This should really be the core of your study and try to use your questions, go through the clue bank all the way and then go through it again. That's really going to be your, your most effective, most efficient method of first study. Great. Um, Dr. Bruce Raymer, I actually am going to defer this question to you. Um, and we are seeing this more and more often here at UWorld. Do you have any recommendations for students who are studying for both the step one and step two at the same time in terms of integrating inf uh, integrating the info from step one and step two? That is a fantastic question. I think, and Dr. Rubin mentioned, uh, there are students now who are in a situation where their schools have set up the curriculum where they'll take step one and step two in succession, or they could theoretically take them out of order. Um, you should understand that although Step two feels like it's relatively easier compared to step one. It's functionally a harder test than step one. So preparing for step one, so preparing for step one and having a good preparation for step one will actually be one of your best ways to prepare for step two. I think for, for most people, I would still recommend that the, the best methodology is to take this test in order. There are certain situations where maybe taking step two first before step one may be more, uh, more efficient for the particular person, but those are, those are more rare. I think really the best thing, particularly now that step one is in a pass fail mode, is to, is to prepare for step one uh, with the idea that you're going to build towards step two. A lot of the content is overlapping and the test, test writers clearly from reports from our tutors and also from the students who work with it, the, the test writers are clearly overlapping a lot of the material. So some of the questions you see on step one will show up again on step two. The step two version may have a little bit more challenging clinical information or may have a couple more uh, Diagnostic options versus a step one question, but functionally the question is the same. So my recommendation is step one first and then step two in, in succession. Maybe take a short break just to decompress. I don't know, and, Dr. Control or Dr. Rubin. Oh, I'm gonna just add, I, I think that's a great answer. I just wanna add one thing. I mean, th this is a tricky question and the, the we're in a new world here with step one being pass fail. And so a lot of these, a lot of students we're finding are asking these questions. I agree with Dr. Bruce Raymer's recommendation, and certainly the more questions you work through, and if you work through both U-World Cubings, you're gonna be in better shape. However, we recognize that there's some students who may be on very tight deadlines. And although it's wonderful that U-World, for example, as a great industry-leading Cubing has grown the size of both of their Cubings, if we're talking about close to 4,000 questions for each Cubing, it is possible that a student needs to take step one and step two and may not have time to really dig into both cubings. In that situation, we might suggest focusing on step two cubing because a lot of the topics for step one, especially the pathophysiology and the pathology topics are covered in one form or another in step two. Also, of course, step two is the big test now that comes with the score while step one is pass fail. And maybe as a compromise, the student could pick and choose from within the step one cubing. What we're hearing a lot from our institutional partners, Dr. Rishamer mentioned we work with Mount Sinai, UNLV, a number of international medical schools as well. We're hearing from the learning advisors and the faculty here that a lot of students are increasingly worried about physiology topics and pathophysiology topics for step one. They're feeling weaker going into their uh, standardized board exams. And so what we might say is that for a student could focus on step two Q-Bank and then selectively pick physiology, pathophysiology, pharmacology topics from step one to really strengthen those areas. And then depending on how much time they have, they can also use other areas from step one. Remember that for both step one and step two, UWorld offers a customization tool where you can pick subtopics within each of the main topics. And that allows for a more efficient working through of both cubings instead of 8,000 questions, maybe that ends up being five to 6,000 questions and a student finds that more manageable. So these are the types of issues we talk through with students when we design tutoring plans for them. Uh, but certainly we ideally, we would want our students to work through both the full step one and the step two cubing time permitting.
Great. Okay. We have several more questions to get through, and I know that we are getting close to time, so I want to try to get through as many as I think we may have lost uh, Kelly for a second, so I'm going to try to help. Are you back, Kelly? Yeah, I was just about to start reading the questions. Oh, go sorry, ahead. Sorry, I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, the question at hand that I was asking Dr. Cantola was: um, Is there a way for it to um, highlight automatically the keywords in each question? And so she was going to answer that for us. Sure. Um, no, we've intentionally left that feature out. I know that there are other um, Q banks that offer that feature, um, but our concern was that students might depend on that too much and it could become a, like a crutch for um, being able to pick up what the key uh, historical clues are and the key findings were in the clinical exam. So we considered that for a while, but we ultimately made a decision to leave that out of our questions. Perfect, thank you. Okay, and then um, we, again, we'll try to get through these um, as quick as possible. Um, one of the questions um, that um, maybe Dr. Rubin can answer is, do you recommend doing UWorld Step 3 for Step 2? I love this question. And I say that because when I personally was doing a lot of tutoring uh, with students these days, less so directly, this was a tool that I would use with students that I, a lot of times, students who we work with and some of the students out there uh, listening to this call may be feeling overwhelmed. They may be feeling low on confidence. And one of the things you think about when you're studying or when you're advising students is what can I do to gain an edge? What can I do to feel more confident um, and feel like I have some advantage potentially over other students? And one of the things that worked really well was incorporating step three Cubing from UWorld into step two prep because there's a lot of overlap, you know, between step two and step three with step three being a little more management heavy, but a lot of that management can show up in some form on step two. Now that used to be, I think a great tool, but that was also when there were many fewer questions from step two cubing. There was a time when there were fewer than 2000 questions. I remember too, like Dr. Bruce Raymer, uh, I've been in medical education now for a while, advising students and working with students, and there used to not be that many questions, but now there are, I believe, around 4,000 or maybe greater from UWorld alone. There are other resources, other QBanks out there as well, and certainly there are practice exams, the UWorld assessments, and BMEs. There are a lot of questions out there, and so that I, I would not necessarily give that advice now that students need to dig into step two to, to step three QBank. I actually think that now. There's plenty from step two and students can consider doing a second pass through step two cubing selectively focusing on their mark questions or focusing on specific uh, areas of difficulty, incorrect questions. That should be enough, even with the heightened emphasis and importance of the score. So it's a good idea. It's something we used to recommend, but the way things are now, there probably isn't that much of a need to do that. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Rubin. Um, all right, um, so let's go to the next question and maybe um, Dr. Bruce Raymer can answer this. We actually have this, I think, a couple of times in here. Um, can you prep for the IFOM CSE using the USMLE Step 2 QBank on UWorld? If not, which of the UWorld QBanks would you utilize? Right. So I think the IFOM and the CSE, I'm not, it's that little acronym at the end, I'm not particularly, um, not particularly familiar with what that CSE stands for, but it's the International Foundations of Medicine Examination. And this is basically an exam that's, that's released by the NBME, but for international medical schools and for international medical graduates. It's, it's trying to create a, a level of standardization. And from what I understand, um, there are, there's a basic and there's a clinical science one. So if the CSC is referring to a clinical science exam, then essentially what you're talking about is step two or shelf exams. And so in that case, 
the, the, the step two Q bank should be a perfect resource for that. Um, and frankly, I, I would just say the step two Q bank resource for your world is awesome in general, just for learning clinical medicine It is a fantastic resource. Um, someone was asking another question. They answered to how many questions should you do minimum. And I would say every day of your clinical rotations, try to do at least three to five questions, just the beginning of the day with your coffee, to get your brain going and, and, and so forth. And when you're on a dedicated study period, obviously you're going to do a lot more questions, more in the range of maybe 80 to 100 questions per day. So yeah, for this IF, IFOM and just in general for, for studying throughout, uh, I would use this QBank link to be the right, this would be the right resource. Perfect, thanks, great answer. That actually answered a, a few more of the questions um, that were um, on here just in different formats. Um, the next one, um, the next one is, um, do you recommend to review the UWorld SIM tests after we finish them, or is it meant only to see how prepared we are? Dr. Cantola. Yeah, um, I mean, the SIM tests are really helpful because they do give you that three-digit score predictor, um, but I wouldn't just take them and then only look at that three-digit score and either feel great or panic or, you know, it's not meant to just inside a feeling. Um, we do have, uh, you know, all of the explanations that go with those questions. Certainly, if you're doing the SIM exam, that's a lot of questions for one day, especially if you were to add on some additional question blocks and try to simulate the actual seven block exam. So your brain's probably going to be shot and you don't need to review those explanations that day. But for questions that you got wrong, I know if you're triaging your time, I would go ahead and, and review um, the explanations, at least for the questions um, that you got wrong on the SIM exam. Um, that way, uh, you know, you have another opportunity to improve in that particular area um, as you're moving forward in your dedicated study time. Awesome. Thank you. And then and can, oh, oh, go ahead. I, can, oh, I just, yeah, I, I completely, I completely agree with that, but I wanted to add that we think it's crucial to review the explanations to any questions that students work on for board exam practice, whether they're just standalone blocks from UWorld or whether they're the self-assessments from UWorld or NBMEs, that's really where so much of the learning happens. Yes, you get the, the assessment, you get the score, and that's helpful in terms of tracking your learning. Uh, but the, a lot, the, lear the key learning happens with explanations. Traditionally, UWorld, one of the big advantages of the UWorld self-assessment was that there were comprehensive explanations of the same high quality that the main QBank had versus NBMEs did not have explanations. I think many of the students out there listening right now are aware that NBME now offers explanations to all of their tests and they're, they're very good. And so students should review those as well, but that doesn't change the value of reviewing UWorld explanations. And just a, one more point is that there's actually a, a discipline issue related to that as well, where there's a, we all have a tendency to do questions and then just to wanna to move on to the next thing and to not wanna go back and actually uh, go through the questions go over why we got them right and wrong, make flashcards, et cetera. And so when you can force yourself as a student to review the explanations to these, these uh, practice exams, it really reinforces a sense of discipline in your own study that is going to help you not just with reviewing that exam, but will also give you positive effects moving forward. So we absolutely recommend that students always review carefully any practice exam they take. Awesome. Um, I think this is a great question um, that I wanted to get out there and I'll ask either Dr. Rubin or Dr. Bruce Raymer to answer this one. Do you recommend outside step two tutoring services for prep? Are there any top services worth considering? How many sessions are usually needed to show improvements in scores? Uh, Dr. Rubin, do you want me to start off and maybe you can chime in as well? Yeah, I'm not sure I'm aware of any tutoring services. So maybe <laughs> Dr. Bruce Raymer, I can kick that to you. Well, I, I didn't, we, we don't normally go into this too much, but obviously we, we run a company called Elite Medical Prep and we feel that we do the best, uh, yeah, the best job possible uh, in, in tutoring for these exams. Um, we have really highly trained team and we're very selective in people we put on board. We also, I think I mentioned structured personalization. We have also have our own internal curriculum um, that we use and build, uh, and we deploy throughout the tutoring. Uh, and we provide a really high level of, of, of care, uh, sort of involvement from the tutor and also from our team. Uh, so it's, it's really a fantastic service. I, 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 uh, so I would give us a strong recommendation. Um, and for anybody who is, is, is interested in using our service, um, we do offer a free trial. Um, so you can 
pay for one hour and get a two hour session and get a chance to test it out with, with your tutor. Um, we have a number of other offerings as well. Maybe Dr. Rubin, you want to elaborate a little bit more? Yeah. I mean, I would just say that a lot of what we're talking about in, in this uh, webinar, like we, uh, Dr. Rubin and I are very involved still. Um, many years later in the hiring, the screening, the training of our tutors, the creation of our curriculum and, and everything. So what, if, what we're talking about here, if this makes sense to you, this, if this is useful, this, this is the kind of stuff that our tutors are trained to, to go over with students. In addition to the to tutoring for step two and shelf exams in step one, we also have been increasingly advising students on residency application. We have a really great program that we put together involving uh, mock test prep, uh, I'm sorry, uh, mock interviewing and personal statement editing and just general advising from tutors who uh, themselves were recently in your shoes and, uh, and very successfully made it through the process and have been trained to advise students just like you. So um, we're really, we love what we do. We, uh, we are um, really, we feel a great sense of satisfaction working with students over, uh, over a long period of time and also working, being, being, uh, fortunate to, to be invited to these types of webinars and to learn from the, the great UWorld team and also all of our contacts from different medical schools all across the world have really given us a great insight into what's going on with students and what's happening in medical education. And, and we, we always try to uh, use that, that kind of insider knowledge and, and being aware of what's going on to use that to give the best advice and the best tutoring to our students. Yeah, I'll just add one last thing here is that there was a question of exactly how much tutoring one should do or not do. Um, that really is a personal decision and it's something we can talk about uh, if you schedule a consultation with us and we can figure that out. So that's something that maybe for a different discussion period um, and it'd be, we'd be happy to discuss that further. Um, please feel, re feel free to reach out to us via our website and our contact form. Perfect. Um, I think that's really, that's, you know, a really great answer. But also for those of you um, who aren't familiar, UWorld doesn't have a lot of partnerships with companies. Um, and so we really do see the value in elite medical prep and, and what they're doing for, for students. Um, so that should speak volumes as well um, in the way we present with them and do webinars with them. Um, but again, it's 12.06, so I want to be really, um, you know, um, sensitive with people's time. Um, I want to get two questions answered for sure. Um, and one of them is, are there any suggestions for DO students who plan to take both the Comlex Level 2 and the Step 2? Um, and I'll, I can go ahead and answer that. And um, UWorld specifically has a Level 2 uh, supplement that we um, can add on to our Step 2 QBank. Um, and so we've had really great success in working with um, several schools um, in developing this and implementing it into them. Um, most of your DO schools are going to recommend that you take your Comlex level two first and then follow it by the step two. Um, and again, if you go through our entire question bank plus the supplement, um, we do uh, feel that that is is completely acceptable way to prepare yourself for both of those exams. Um, but then the next one I'm going to give back over to the physicians, um, and it really is talking about how the step one has now gone to a pass fail. How do you prepare yourself to go back to a three digit score with the step two? What percentage in you world is giving you that passing score in step two? Um, and what are we doing um, and or other companies, um, for instance, um, doing to prepare students from a pass fail situation to back to a scoring? Um, and so I think Dr. Bruce Raymer, you might be the best to answer this question. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a, a challenging question and one that's come up recently. I've spoken to a lot of different uh, learning advisors at different medical schools across the US and even some from uh, medical schools that are abroad. Um, and they're struggling with this, this right now. So the classic sort of understanding is that in the, in the pass fail environment, um, step one remains a challenging test and you should not underestimate it. Uh, and so in order to be safe to pass, you should try to aim to score more than 65% right. And that's a rough indication. Now, there's a problem here and that the NBME has never been very open about how they grade the test, or how the difficulty is grading. And so everybody else is kind of trying to operate in this gray zone, not knowing what the answer is. And the, really the only way we've been able to get answers is by waiting for the results to come back from this year and, and I guess next year's cohorts of students. Um, so if you're in this situation right now where you're, you're wondering about that, I would try to aim for over 65%. So 
safely try to go for the 68 to 70% to ensure you're going to pass. You do not want to fail step one. That's going to look really bad on your transcript. So you really want to make sure you pass it on the first attempt. Uh, and then for step two, percentage correct, that the, the, the practice scores we think are still, the practice scores and the practice tests, including the U-World self-assessments, which are really excellent. We actually have been uniformly almost better than the NBME materials themselves for step two. Uh, those practice score assessments are still very valid. And we don't have any indication that they're incorrect. However, we just don't know if that information is going to change in the coming months or this year. So it's going to, unfortunately, going to take about a year to work everything out. Perfect. That was um, really helpful. Um, okay, I think we have time for, for maybe one more question. Um, and um, this one I'm going to send to Dr. Cantola. Um, can I search for a specific topic in my used questions and create a, bl a block for it to review and master it? For example, if I choose shoulder Dystocia? Yes. <laughs> Can I create a block for that topic only? Um, it doesn't go down quite that granular where you can find it specifically on shoulder dystocia, but that would be um, a good reason to, as you're going through the questions, um, if there's a particular topic, um, you can make you know, a flashcard out of it or a note card. Um, sorry, a uh, flashcard or my notebook. Um, my notebook is searchable. There is a search bar for that. Um, and then as far as the granularity goes, um, to find the question specifically on a shoulder dystocia, I'm trying to think exactly how you, you, you know, probably would be on the OBGYN rotation. Um, and then I don't know all the categories and, and, you know, systems by heart off the top of my head, but um, there's probably one uh, that has to do with like complications during birth. You know, you kind of could sort that way. You can always go back to your uh, old practice exams and especially if you've been taking them um, kind of in a systematic way, you'll always have access to that. So you could, um, let's say you had taken the shelf subject and the systems and kind of drilled it down to a category and had had that question. You could go back to your practice exams and find it that way. But um, at this time, there's not a way just to search your old exams by like a very, very specific subject like that. But it's a great idea. And I like feedback like this because we get to pass it on to our team. Uh, just to figure out how we can continue to make our cubing more useful for students. So thank you for that question. Yep. Another suggestion that we just got was, could we um, add in, um, could we add in communication, more questions on communication skills? That's helpful for IMGs. Okay. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'll pass that on as well. Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Is there um, any questions, Dr. Rubin or Dr. Bruce Raymer, that you want to pick up? Um, we are about 11 minutes over. So I, I just want to be aware of that. Oh, I think, I think we've answered a lot of questions. We've tried to answer some through the chat. And so I think for those who have, uh, have some of those additional questions, please look to that chat. I think it'll be available to people who registered for this. And then in the follow-up email, uh, they'll be able to read those. Some great information. Perfect. Okay. Well, we feel really honored that you guys have spent the last hour and 12 minutes with us. Um, and thank you, Dr. Cantola, Dr. Bruce Raymer, and Dr. Rubin for your time as well, because we know that is very um, few and far between. Um, so um, if you have any questions um, after this, you are more than welcome to um, email me at medicalsales at uworld.com. Um, I will try to get all of the questions answered for you, pass them on to content if that's where it needs to go. Um, but again, you will get a copy of this recording um, in a follow-up email from us. Um, and we look forward to you joining us in a webinar in the future. Okay, everybody, I'm gonna stop the uh, stop the webinar at this point. And thank you for your attention today. And uh, thank you for everybody joining, joining us. Um, we will send follow-up emails with uh, information and that should include a, a link to the recording as well as a, a copy of the chat, uh, the, the public chat for everybody. Thanks again for your attention and uh, thank you for joining us today.